Has anybody been following the, the news about that whole matter of scalping tickets at the new event center? Okay. So that tells me that maybe, maybe you've been thinking that you had a, an extra profession coming up here, that if they didn't outlaw the scalping, you could buy a few tickets, sell a few on the side. Folks, don't quit your day job, because it's going to be illegal, if it isn't already. It will be, be illegal, is illegal to buy event center tickets and sell them at a higher price within so many feet or so much distance of the event center. To practice called scalping, somebody pays far more than what the tickets should cost, somebody is benefiting far more than they should. It's all because of supply and demand. When something is short, the price tends to go up. And if I'm holding something that you want, and it's a one of a kind, there's always a chance that I can make you pay dearly for it. That's scalping. Moses and the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, not a place where there was a lot of food, not a place where there was a lot of water, not a place where there was a lot of shelter. It would have been wonderful if somebody had had a couple bottles of Gatorade and a few packages of kosher hot dogs to share. They could have sold those at premium prices. Okay. You're thirsty, huh? Well, I've got this bottle of Gatorade. What will you give me for it? And what will you give me, sir? And you, sir? And the auction would begin. It could have easily been done. When Jesus was done feeding the 5,000 people, and he showed them just how simple it was for him to multiply a few fish and a few loaves of bread into enough to feed 5,000 people and have 12 baskets left over, it would have been easy for him to say, okay, for so many, so many gold coins, I'll come and do that in your community. Or they may have been able to say, would you just kind of do that and we'll go sell it on your behalf and up the price as well. Wow, sell it to the highest bidder? That'd be quite a bundle. But the idea of scalping never came up either place. It never occurred to them. It would have meant that only a few would have received, and the many would have been left without. No, the people were not left on their own. God was providing for them. And so there was no need for them to consider scalping. It wasn't even an option. It was a sheer gift and grace of God that provided for them. Manna in the wilderness to thousands of people that were wandering and following God's lead. And five loaves and a couple of fish multiplied to feed 5,000 simply at Jesus' command. But all that didn't happen without some complaining. Even though they weren't scalping food and drink, the people were not totally innocent. Their trust in God in the wilderness had evaporated like sun on a hot desert floor. The people were not, interest, were not innocent. He had saved them. God had saved them from slavery in Egypt. He was leading them to their own land. He had been quite upfront with them that he would provide for them throughout the whole wilderness journey. And yet, now they were complaining, we're hungry. What did you do? Bring us out here? Lead us into the desert to kill us here from, hungry? from hunger? I wish we were back at the flesh pots in Egypt. At least we had lots of bread there and we ate our fill. The people complained. In spite of God's generosity, the people complained. The whole story bounces back and forth on a couple things there. It bounces back and forth between the people's needs and God's generosity and the people's complaints and God's grace. What is it with these people? What part of God providing for them don't they understand? Don't they recognize that their souls 
are even emptier than their stomachs. Once the manna came, oh well, sure, their physical need of hunger, or for, physical need for food was met, but they still didn't get the point. They were told to gather only what they needed, that on the sixth day, there would be plenty enough to gather for the seventh day, and that day they could carry it over. But any other day, gather only what you need, because tomorrow I'll provide for you again. That's what they were told. But that's not what they did. They weren't quite trusting God to fulfill his promise. And so some of them tried to gather up more than what they would need for that day, thinking, I'll save it for tomorrow. It didn't work. It spoiled. It rotted. It stunk. It didn't work at all. But what it did do was point out their lack of trust in God. It pointed out their spiritual hunger and showed that to be greater than their physical hunger. 1,200 years later, after Jesus had multiplied the fish and the loaves with the, the crowd of 5,000 people, that whole thing had a, a repeat performance. The people were, were hungry. They had a little bit on hand. God multiplied it, provided for them. Everything was good and well. Everybody was, was satisfied. And there were those 12 baskets left over. But then the people started thinking, hmm, that was mighty fine bread. And the price was right. Let's go find this Jesus and have him do it again. Let's have him do it again and again and again. Well, it didn't work with manna and Moses, and it didn't work with the bread and Jesus. And it doesn't work now either. As soon as God provides for you and I, as soon as God provides something for us, we change our, need of lists, our, our list of needs and wants. We may check off, okay, I'm healed from this. But now how about if you give me this, God? As soon as this prayer request has been answered, we think, okay, that worked. Let's do this again. I'll ask for something else. And so our schemes get bigger and grander and more elaborate. And we, re we, re we reveal a little bit more of our lack of trust in God, for we continue to beg and ask and tell him what we need rather than allowing him to provide for us and recognize our need. We probably don't want to use the terms greed and gluttony, but that's a big part of what it is. You and I are greedy, no different than the people that were, were wandering in the wilderness, no different than the people who saw Jesus multiply the fish and the loaves. What can we get that we don't have? What can we be given that we might not have to pay for? Those words aren't exactly common in our descriptions of ourselves. We probably don't put those words on a resume that we've written or some kind of summary of who we are describing us. You and I have an abundance of things, possessions, material goods, as well as the immaterial goods of safety, love, and the compassion of family. And yet we want more, and we work hard to get it. We're also called to share what we have, but we judge our neighbors by saying, I worked for it, let them work for it too. My wife Sandy and I are doing some poking around in boxes and corners and closets, storage areas of our home, taking a look at the kinds of things that decorate our home and making some changes and some shifts. We're finding that there are quite a few things that we no longer use, quite a few things that we no longer need, and yes, there are some things that we no longer want, and there are some things that we're just not quite sure about. Tucked in a corner of the garage, is a wood stove, an antique wood stove that we use to heat our log house 
at Outlaw Ranch when we were directors there. Cold, drafty house, marvelous log house, marvelous stone fireplace, but without that wood-burning stove that we could stand up next to and warm ourselves from, that would have been a mighty cold house. The stove was called a Wilson. We nicknamed it Woody, and that's what it burned. But it's been 25 years at least since there was a fire in the pot belly of that stove, but there sits the stove in the corner of the garage. I don't think we're going to be heating our home with that anymore. We've got a few more chairs than we have fannies in our family, and so every time somebody comes, we have no trouble finding chairs for everybody. There's wood chairs, there's varnished chairs, there's painted chairs, there's folding chairs, there's creaky chairs that should stand out in the rain and soak up things a little bit, but yeah, there's more chairs than we need. There's a few area rugs that it's time to get rid of, some that we haven't used for a while. And then there's some decorator things, all that kind of stuff. There's a part of me that would just love to put it all in the garage. Take one picture and put that one picture on Craigslist and say, come and get it, it's free. But I'm not going to. You see, I want to sell it. I want to have a little cash from that stuff. Okay, so now maybe that analogy doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't hold completely. But that's the closest I'm going to come today to describing my greed and gluttony. I know what shape I'm in. Do you know what shape you're in? And the way in which you expect more from God, even as he has so abundantly provided for you. We tend to want to take care of ourselves and do it all ourselves. <clears throat> we fail at times to trust God to provide. We simply want to provide for ourselves. God sees through us. We are as transparent as glass. God sees right through us. He knows our greed. He knows our gripes. He knows our complaints. He knows our thoughts. He knows our lack of trust. And he responds. He responds not with punishment, but he responds with pure grace. He comes to us at this table and he says, here, this is my body. It's given for you. He comes at that same table and he says, here, this is my blood. It's given, shed for you for the forgiveness of your greed, your gluttony, your lack of trust, your desire to do it yourself. Here, take and eat. It's for you. There is no shortage. There is no scalping. There will be no running out of bread, dark or light, roast beef or sandwich meat. There will be no running out of grape jelly or blueberry jelly. No shortage. No scalping. No punishment. Just grace. Pure grace. Pure gift. From God to you. For Jesus has said, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never hunger and will never thirst. Pure grace. Let us pray. Lord, even though we deserve to be punished, you bless us with your gifts. Thank you for your generosity, for your love, your compassion, for the grace that you shower upon us. May we, in turn, be as gracious to all we meet. Amen.